Once again, I bring you the newest camera in my pro video camera collection, both in terms of when it was made and when I got it two weeks ago. That's when I got it, not when it was made. It was made in 2004, and it has the same styling as other cameras made about that time period, like this one I showed you in one of my recent videos, uh, the uh, DV camera. I think this one is from 03, 04, something like that. But this one does not take DV tape like that one. It also doesn't take beta tape, and it doesn't take VHS. It doesn't take tape at all. This one takes flash memory, and if you know me at all, you're probably going, what are you doing with it then? Something recent? Something modern? Well, 2004, I'm afraid, was nearly 20 years ago. So if you're my age, take a lap, catch your breath, choke back the tears, and we'll press on. Now, this camera is not modern. We've been making flash-based cameras for over 20 years at this point. This one does not excel over my other cameras in particular in what it shoots. It shoots standard definition video. It looks very good. I have other cameras that also shoot very good SD video. What is interesting about this one is how and when it did it. To cut to the chase, this was the first professional flash video camera. There were contemporary consumer digital cameras that could shoot video onto flash cards, but this one here is the first professional one. And by that, I mean this specific model that I'm holding changed an industry forever. See, over here on the side, we've got, instead of a tape door, we got a bunch of slots. And that's where you put the memory cards. And you're probably going, this look a little big, kind of oversized for memory cards. Could it be that this takes a strange format? Oh boy, oh golly, it sure does. In 2004, we already had a bunch of competing flash formats. We had Compact Flash, uh, Smart Media Card, MMC, which then became SD, um, Shrek, there were XD Picture Card, Sony Memory Stick, and I think a few other formats. But these were all consumer formats in consumer cameras. This thing takes something completely unique that Panasonic invented that's for professional cameras only called P2 card. This is P2 card and this is P2 card. And if you're familiar with old laptops and PCs in general, you might go, wait a minute, that's PCMCIA. You would of course be correct. This is PCMCIA, also known as PC card. And this is the format we use to add modems and network cards and Wi-Fi and all sorts of things to our laptops back in this era. So what is Panasonic doing putting a flash card into a PCMCIA format? Seems kind of weird when there were like 12 other formats they could have used. Well, the funny thing about this is it's actually a return to form for the PC card format, which was not originally invented for adding peripherals to your computer. It was intended as a memory format. Back in the 90s, before USB flash drives were invented, there were flash drives. They just came in PCMCIA cards like this. This is a six megabyte flash memory card that you can just stick into a laptop and run the appropriate driver and it shows up just like a hard drive. In fact, you could get hard drives in the PC card format. This here is a 260 meg spinning disk. You could even get RAM upgrades for some machines, actual system memory that plugged in through the PC card slot. So the Panasonic using P2 is actually a return to form for the format, which provided an excellent interface for flash memory because of its extremely high speed. The original PC card was pretty quick, but this is a later version called Cardbus, which you can recognize from this gold strip here. And the throughput on this is outstanding because it's actually an entire motherboard PCI slot that's been just brought out to these pins. So you can get about 133 megabytes per second through this interface. So if your first thought on seeing this was, why did Panasonic make a proprietary flash format? It's actually not proprietary. This is a PCMCIA card that you can stick into any laptop and just read like normal. In addition, Panasonic had some very good reasons to make their own flash format instead of using any of the ones that existed already. See, in 2004, flash memory was uh, not really up to the task of Pro Video. These were all pretty much the same NAND flash under the hood as far as I understand, and the throughputs on them were not so great. I don't have hard numbers, but I do have this article from Maximum PC 2004 benchmarking a whole bunch of CF cards against each other. The comparison here shows that most of these don't get much above 2400 kilobytes per second, which is in the ballpark of 20 megabits. Uh, and there's one standout that can get up to 6400 kilobytes per second, which is around 50 megabits. Unfortunately, this just isn't really quite enough for pro video. And if we look at what was being used at the time, we can see why. At this time, pro video was pretty much all still being recorded on videotape, usually beta cam tape uh, or DV tape like the Panasonic that I showed you before. And this stuff worked pretty well. I mean, yeah, it was analog, but most everything was being produced for analog broadcast at that time anyway. So Betacam SP, which had been around for decades at this point, was more than good enough for most applications. If you really needed something better, you could get a digital version of this called Digital Betacam, 
Imagine that. Digital Betacam stored a moderately compressed video stream at 90 megabits a second, so there's your high watermark. That's what this format had to compete with. There was a low cost variant of it called Betacam SX that came out a few years later that did 18 megabits, which several of these cards could conceivably hit, but with not very much margin of error. Plus, I'm pretty sure Beta SX was like a cut rate version and I don't know if it took off at all. It's kind of hard for me to tell since I didn't work in the industry at the time. Still, in order to get broadcasters to switch away from videotape, Panasonic was going to have to sell them on something that was pretty close to as good as the really good stuff, not the low cost stuff. Remember that at this point, tape had been around for decades. It was a known quantity. Broadcasters were familiar with it. They handled tons of it per year, but tape does have some drawbacks. It's big, it's fragile, and it's linear. The size issue, I don't need to convince you of, right? Smaller is better. Now these are 20 to 30 years old and haven't been maintained in that long, so this is a little unfair, but all the same, dropping a camera with a tape mechanism in it can knock all sorts of things out of position, and that takes you out of commission immediately. Meanwhile, I've got two or three boxes of digital cameras that have been knocked around and shuffled from box to box for decades, and every single one of them works perfectly. I haven't really encountered one that didn't because there's just no moving parts. Then, of course, there's the issue that these are linear access. If you want to play back video that you just recorded in the field, you're going to have to rewind. And after you rewind and you're playing back, if something happens that you want to take video of, you're going to have to fast forward to the end before you can hit record, or you'll overwrite what you just recorded before. Editing has similar problems. You have to wait for the tape to get from here to there. So if you want to splice this part into this part, you've got to very carefully roll back to the part you want and then mark it and then move forward and mark the other one. And then you have to wait for the two decks to go back and forth to do their thing to copy onto the third deck. And you have to have all this sophisticated machinery to synchronize it. And if any one of those breaks, you just can't edit. This is all a huge bummer. The fragility, the waiting, the precision. In a fast-paced industry like news production, you want to just get the footage and then just throw it at the TV. You want to skip all this waiting and, and tedious fiddling. Eliminating all of that with a smaller media that's more durable and that you can maybe just edit on an iMac is a huge bonus if it can be done without compromising the quality of the media. Panasonic had to deliver something that was high bitrate, durable, and could record for a long time. They knew how to do the first two, but they struggled with the third one. That's one other problem with flash compared to videotape. Videotape is cheap no matter what you're putting on it. Flash, hmm, not so much. To give you an idea what Panasonic was up against here, let's take a look at Betacam SX. A Betacam SX tape recording for 60 minutes at 18 megabits per second comes out to about eight gigabytes of storage. In 2004, a 256 meg flash card cost you $57. So to get eight gigs, you would have had to spend 1800 bucks. Digibeta makes the problem even worse. With digital beta cam, the same runtime, 60 minutes at 90 megabits per second comes out to about 40 gigabytes of data storage. To get that in flash, you would have had to spend $10,000. Now, I'm not sure how much a digital beta cam tape cost. I mean, maybe they were a little expensive for tapes, but I mean, it couldn't have been more than 30 bucks, right? I mean, it's one banana, Michael. What could it cost? $10? I mean, even if they were $100, which I'm sure they weren't, that would still be killer compared to 10 grand or even 1800. The only solution for a flash-based camera at this time would have been for its media to only record for a couple minutes or for it to cost a king's ransom. The P2 cards did both. They were solving a problem that wasn't yet ready to be solved. You couldn't shoot pro video on flash in 2004. The technology just wasn't there yet. But Panasonic put their foot down and said, we're gonna do this, and they did it despite it being impossible. And because the camera and the card came out at once and the cards, just a card, doesn't do very much, I'm gonna show you a little bit about the camera while I explain some more about the P2 card. Mostly the camera works like any other, so let's start by loading the media. So you just take your card and load it into one of the slots here. Now, slots, plural, what's that about? Most camcorders that you've seen that take flash memory probably only have one slot. Well, it's pretty common for professional camcorders to have multiple. The one I'm shooting on right now has two, but also consider that pretty much all modern professional video cameras owe their lineage to this one, so you could say that the reason they have multiple slots is because this one had multiple slots. If this particular camera hadn't, it may have taken a while for anybody to figure out they could do this. Now you can configure modern cameras to do a lot of things with these slots. For instance, relay recording, where it records until one card is full, then moves on to the next one. You can also have them record the same footage onto multiple cards in case something happens to one. Or in some cases, you can have them record to one card while recording a second lower resolution stream to a second card, which makes editing easier. 
The Panasonic doesn't do all those tricks, but it does do the first one. If I press the record button, you'll see the light above one of the cards starts blinking, indicating it's recording onto that one. Now I can actually remove this other one, and it won't cause any problems at all. The advantage to this is that you can actually swap the cards out on the fly while it's recording. So even after you've filled up all the cards in all five slots, you can just take out one it's not recording on and put another one in. So you can effectively record forever this way. This seems like a monumental feature, unlimited recording time, but I think it's actually a solution to a problem that P2 created for itself. Sure, you couldn't do continuous recording with a videotape, but you got about 60 minutes per tape. How long did you get on a P2 card? Well, the first cards they made were two gigs, and you would get about four minutes of video on one of those. So if you filled all five slots, you could get 20 minutes. Now that was worse than the shortest Betacam tapes available. And how much did you spend on a two gig card? Well, I don't have an exact price, but I can tell you that the four gig card was $1,700. So about twice the price per gig of the CF cards of that time. I'd guess that the two gig was probably still over $1,000 for reasons that will become apparent later in this video. So in order to fill up those five slots, you were gonna pay $5,000. Add in the 18 grand that you spent for the camera body itself, and you're now looking at a $23,000 kit that can shoot for 20 minutes. I love the onwards march of technology. The situation later got better, of course, as Panasonic released larger, cheaper cards. Uh, by 2007, you could buy a 16 gig card for around $1,200, and five of those would get you 80 minutes, which gets you back into videotape territory, although again, for about five grand. Now, if you're wondering why anyone would have sprung for this crap, let's talk about some of the stuff that Flash could do that was unique and good. There's a feature on this camera called loop recording mode, and in loop mode, the camera continuously records from card one all the way to card five, then starts back at card one and starts overwriting. This allows you to take your camera, put it on a tripod, flip out the LCD, sit down and hit the vape. Well, I guess you'd be smoking a real cigarette back then. But you just sit there while your camera's pointed at something that's going to happen, like a building that's about to fall down. And then when the building starts falling down, you don't do anything. You don't hit record, you don't even get up. You just chill, set your stopwatch. You got 20 minutes of media in there, set your stopwatch for 18 minutes. When your stopwatch goes off, stand up, hit stop, and you now know that you have 18 minutes of footage after the collapse, including two minutes before the collapse, and you didn't have to do anything. There's another variant of this called pre-recording in which you don't have to hit record at all. The camera is continuous recording at all times into a little internal memory buffer that can get about eight seconds of video. So say you're setting your camera up, you put it on the tripod and you're futzing around with your cables and whatnot, waiting for a press conference to begin. Some guy runs up on the stage to the podium and starts screaming obscenities into the microphone and gets tackled by staffers. You had no idea that was gonna happen. But as long as within the first eight seconds you hit that record button, you'll get the shot. When you hit that button, it just dumps the eight second buffer onto the P2 card and then starts recording normally after that. So at any given moment, you've got eight seconds before you hit the button that you can rescue. For instance, I went to my standard reference park and I pointed my camera at a crane and I just stood there for 10 minutes reading my phone. And when I turned around, I saw the crane had started moving when I wasn't looking. So I hit the button and as you can see, I got the whole shot before and after it started moving. Now this sort of thing is exactly what people would have wanted out of solid state cameras. This is the magic that you just can't do on videotape. Continuous recording? That's impossible. I guess you could get two decks, set them side by side, and have one record while the other one's rewinding, and then just cycle back and forth entirely by hand. Maybe there was an automated mechanism for it, but that's a huge pain and you'd spend as much on that gear as you would just buying the P2 cards. And the pre-record thing, to the best of my knowledge, that was completely impossible with videotape. Uh, I guess maybe they could have done it with Digibeta or something, but that is a feature that is very, very flash, not very videotape. So these are the things that I think put P2 on the map to begin with. What would have convinced somebody in 2004 to spend a king's ransom on a camera that didn't take any of their normal media and cost a fortune to buy cards that could only record a couple minutes. Features like this would have been huge selling points to a few people. Those people would have just about killed for features like this, I'm sure, and hey, sure enough, these things sold, so it must have been worth it. A couple other quick things about the camera itself. It does have an LCD. Uh, this is the earliest camera that I have that has one. This thing also has a voice memo button on here, which just quickly records a snippet of voice with no video, uh, which as far as I know would be impossible on videotape. It's got to roll tape in order to record, so I think that's a new feature as well. And then of course, being that it is a digital camera now, we've got these controls here, this little D-pad that lets us navigate the files saved on the card. 
When you're actively watching a video, you can use these transport controls to scrub forward and back, stop, play, and pause, just like a videotape. But fortunately, they didn't make you use those controls to select a clip. You can just use the D-pad here to select whatever you want and play it back. And, and of course, you can do file management from there, format the cards, select and delete stuff. It's just like a digital camera. You'll also notice there's an SD card slot here, but that's not actually for recording video. This camera has the densest menu I've ever seen. I've never seen this many settings in anything before. I think there might be a thousand options in this camera's menu. So that SD card is just for saving your settings. It's got like customizable user menus and like very specific zebra stripe thresholds and like God knows what else is buried in there. And you can save all that to an SD card. And then when you drop this camera into a lake, you can get the SD card out, put it into a camera that's still working and presto, it's just like your old camera, the one you dropped in a lake. Now, finally, uh, as the camera picture itself goes, like I said, it's, it's a lot like my others. Uh, it's a very high quality, you know, mid 2000s SD picture. Uh, this one can shoot in 16.9 widescreen, which wasn't actually that unusual at the time. There's a bunch of videotape based cameras that can also do that. I think that the sensor itself is actually 16.9, and when you shoot in 4.3 mode, it just crops off the edges. You can also record in several different formats. Uh, 60 field per second interlaced, 30 frame per second progressive, and 24 frame per second progressive for a film look. Now like my DV Panasonic, this one also supports FireWire output, but there's just a blank back here because they didn't actually install the option for that. And part of the reason for that is that at this point, FireWire had become obsolete. With FireWire, you had to record video off of a camera in real time. You couldn't copy it off any faster than normal playback. So you plug it into your iMac or whatever, you hit play and you wait. If you've got 40 minutes of video, you wait 40 minutes for it to copy off of the camera. With this one, you've got lots of options. You can just uh, take the P2 card out, put it in a laptop, read it there. You can put it in a USB adapter, read it there. You can put it in a, a P2 uh, transfer box that moves it onto a hard drive or on this camera, you can actually plug it in to USB. It has a USB 2.0 port down there, which in 2004 was still, I think, not a guarantee. It could have been USB 1 in a more terrifying world. Now the manual implies that this wasn't working at release. It says the USB port is for later use, but this one appears to have received a firmware update or something because I plug it into my PC and I get five card readers and I can just pull the files off the P2 cards. It actually copies nice and quick. I get about uh, 160 megabits. Contemporary accounts, however, characterize P2 as being really irritating to work with because it would actually copy at lower than real-time speeds. So you'd shoot for 20 minutes and then spend 40 minutes copying the data off the card. I can only guess that that's because they were using like really crappy old USB to PCMCIA adapters that just implemented the card bus interface really poorly. I don't know why else it would have been that slow. Now, of course, like I said, you could put this in a laptop and just copy the data off at native card bus speeds, but laptops of that era had very small hard drives, generally speaking, and most of them couldn't handle editing video, certainly not at the bit rates that this used. So about that, what is the bit rate? Well, it's adjustable. It can do three formats, and the highest one is DVC Pro at 50 megabits. So there's your high watermark. The other two are DVC Pro at 25 and DV at 25. Now, of course, both those speeds clearly outclass all the cards on the market, at least according to this information. So Panasonic had to have been using the best grade top binned chips available. And even then, it would have been tough to get consistent 50 megabits. That goes a long ways towards explaining why Panasonic had to invent their own format and why it was so expensive. But there's still a lot more going on with the P2 card than I've let on. I can only speculate as to Panasonic's motivations for how strange the design that I'm holding out on ended up being. Maybe they felt that even the 50 megabit cards on the market still weren't fast enough for what they were doing, or maybe they felt that they weren't reliable enough. I don't really know, but either way, the solution that they settled on was wild. I'm going to show you what's inside one of these cards now. I'm gonna warn you not to do this at home because you really can't get these apart without destroying them. Uh, mine still works, but uh, yours might not be so lucky. I will point out, however, in the process of disassembling this, I confirmed what I'd heard. These are actually little die cast chassis. They're not just two pieces of sheet metal. They're actually um, a sheet metal cover over like a die cast hunk of aluminum. So these are quite heavy. So let me get the other one that I've disassembled out of the camera. It's stuck. It's, it's jammed in there because I disassembled it. Oh no. 
was able to use my health insurance card to help get the card out. It's the only thing it's good for. So I pry the lid off and now I'll show you what's inside. So we'll start by removing the sheet metal cover under which we find this assembly. A couple screws here you have to take out. This guy can be removed. Move this plastic protector and these two metal shields. Okay, and with the covers off, you'll see that this is just four SD cards. And your eyes are not deceiving you, and this is not some industry trick. They're not, you know, some other flash format that's just in an SD-shaped carrier. These are just SD cards. Let me show you. See? It's an off-the-shelf Panasonic 1 gig SD card. It's got the lock switch and everything. It's got a label. Now, I don't know what these were sold for. Uh, maybe Panasonic was selling consumer camcorders that took them. Maybe they were selling consumer digital cameras that took them. Uh, or maybe they're just, you know, weirdos and they decided to put it in a retail package and put a label on it and everything just to then put inside this. I'm not super sure. Now, you can see this is only a one gig card. And this is a four gig P2 card, as it says on the cover. Now, at first I thought, okay, well, maybe they just couldn't get enough throughput from four gig flash chips if they were even being manufactured. So they just put four in a trench coat to get the four gigs at 50 megabits they needed, but I don't think that's what's going on. If we flip this over, you'll see there's some more circuitry on here, which isn't surprising. You can't just plug SD cards straight into the card bus interface. So presumably this is the hard drive controller that lets them talk to the computer. Now, at first I thought, maybe this is just a JBOD controller. That means just a bunch of disks. It refers to taking a series of drives of a smaller capacity and adding them together to get the combined capacity and then treating it as just one hard drive. And that would support my theory that these were fast enough at the one gig speed, but I don't think that's true. What I really think is going on is that these aren't fast enough. They can only do 20 or 18 megabits. And this is running them in RAID 0. If this is striping these four SD cards together, running them in RAID 0, then each successive bit is written onto this, then this, then this, then this, and then back, which increases your throughput to four times any individual card. So if these really are 20 megabit flash, then combined, this is a 80 megabit flash card. That would do for Panasonic's purposes. So I think that's what's going on. I don't think you could buy a one gig flash card in 2004 that could do the throughput. I think that they cheated. If this is really true, then incredibly, I'm right. You couldn't make a camcorder with flash in 2004. Panasonic knew that, so they took four slow flash chips and put them in a trench coat so that the camcorder could actually get the throughput it needed. And that is hilarious. Every single P2 card that you bought was also a RAID controller. Sure, why not? If you've got a stack of 50 of these, you've got 50 RAID controllers hanging around. I mean, they could have just put the SD card pins here and then put the RAID controllers in the camera, but I guess then you couldn't plug it into a laptop? I mean, I don't know why this was the best solution. Maybe the RAID controllers aren't that expensive. Maybe this chip is only 20 bucks and most of the cost really is in the flash. So this really was not that outrageous an idea. What I don't really get is why they used this packaging. I mean, surely it would have been cheaper since they were making their own stuff to just solder the NAND chip straight onto the board and skip the package and the lock switch and whatever circuitry's inside the SD cards. I mean, the economies of scale that were going on to produce this thing, I can't even begin to imagine. Now I was gonna move on to do an experiment where I take these four cards out and I put in some other cards. Because you see, I have four 16 gig Samsung SDHC cards I got off eBay. I don't know where they came from, but they're all identical. And I figured, wait, why not? Panasonic for Panasonic, right? Well, you may have noticed that there are numbers beneath these. The numbers indicate uh, which card goes where. Well, those numbers weren't there from the factory. I did try putting the cards in, but I didn't have my camera running, so I missed the whole thing. But to save you the time, it didn't work. Camera just said not recognized, and I think that's because this chip on the back here, this is an 8 meg flash chip, and I think that at the factory they programmed this RAID controller with that flash chip to recognize these specific cards. At least their size, possibly like their serial numbers. It might be keyed to these specific cards. Either way, that's it. That's the mystery of the P2 card exposed. Except it's not a mystery. If you look on Panasonic's website, they actually have pages where they say it contains four SD cards. So they're not even bashful about it. I can't believe this happened. I mean, it makes perfect sense. They couldn't just have you put 
four SD cards in the side of the camera and, and make sure that you never got them out of order. And even if you did do that, you couldn't read it in a computer without a special reader. And at that point, why not just include the reader with the card? Like I said earlier, this looks silly at first, but it's actually very well thought out. It solves a problem that could not have been solved any other way. Now, after our big reveal, I would just like to share one more fun fact with you about this format that has been tickling me pink ever since I discovered it. Imagine nowadays that you're editing 4K, 6K, or 8K video on like, I don't know, like a fifth gen i7, and it just isn't up to the task. Like it's just chugging. You could render it, it'll take an infinite number of hours, but it'll get it done eventually. But for the editing process, you need to be able to load 4K video in near real time, and that takes a lot of processing power that maybe you just don't have. One solution for this is to create a proxy video file. That's where you take all your big files and you just quickly scale them down and render them out to a new set of files at like a third the resolution. Now you load those into your video editor, which can handle them in real time. You do all your editing with the proxy files, and then when you go to do your final render, you substitute the full resolution files. You get the best of both worlds. High resolution, but you can edit at low resolution. Well, on modern cameras, as I mentioned, you can sometimes have the camera output the proxy file live. So as you're recording the main high resolution video, it's also spitting out a smaller video that you can use just for editing purposes. But that requires extra power. So when Panasonic went to sell an HD camera in I think the late 2000s that took P2 cards, they decided to leave that feature out of the camera itself. But since editing HD at that time was still pretty tough on a lot of people's workstations, they did include a way to do it. Enter the Panasonic P2 Proxy Video Encoder card, which is a P2 card that you put in your camera along with all your memory cards. Now when you hit record, the camera sends a video stream to the encoder card, and now the camera saves the high resolution version to the card, while the encoder card saves the low resolution version in parallel. This makes perfect sense because Cardbus started as a memory interface and then became a hardware interface. Panasonic did the exact same thing. They used it for storage first, and then later they used it to actually add hardware functionality to the camera. That just it slays me. Things couldn't have gone better. For the record, this stuff has plummeted in price, but not as much as you might think because P2 is still in use. This camera was probably being used in a film department up until the moment I got it, and a whole bunch of these things, even the standard definition ones, still go for hundreds of dollars. I have to admit the only reason I'm able to make this video is because I found this one for 50 bucks on eBay and I can't figure out why nobody else bid on it. It's in perfect condition, it works. There's other ones that have the same capabilities that go for a lot more, so I don't know how I got so lucky. The P2 cards themselves actually cost as much as the whole camera, because these will still go into modern cameras. You can shoot 1080p on one of these. But otherwise, that's it. Uh, you've seen the deep, dark secret. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, uh, please subscribe, so I know that you're interested in this sort of thing. Uh, if you really enjoyed it, maybe throw me a couple bucks at the links in the description. It's Christmas Eve as I'm recording this, and if you're watching this on Christmas, I just want to wish you a merry one, and for us all to have a brighter, healthier New Year. Thank you for watching, and good luck.